All right, it's all you, sir. Well, good morning. This is Kent Hovind, April uh, 26th, uh, 2015. And let me share a little message with you from uh, the Word of God on Sunday. Uh, so I thought of several titles for this. I've got maybe a dozen different people out there that have asked me, since I've been in prison, to be their adopted dad or their adopted grandpa. And so uh, if you need an adopted dad or adopted grandpa to give you advice, let me know. I'd be honored. But be, bring a helmet uh, when you do that because I'm pretty brutally honest about what you ought to do or not do. So if you need uh, dad or uh, grandpa, let me know. Anyway, title of one title I thought of was Listen to Dad Even in the Little Things. So pay attention. I'm going to share with you... Uh, from Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 1 and 2. We'll try to get further, but I doubt it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. If you take a piece of white blank paper, turn it sideways so it's in what they call landscape mode. Come down halfway down the page. This call is from the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office. Come halfway down the page on the left-hand side and write the word Abraham. Abraham. A couple of things you're going to need if you're going to be a Bible student. We're having great Bible studies in here in my class. Uh, eight, nine, ten guys coming and having a wonderful time. Um, and I'd say there's some simple tools you need to be a Bible student. And a lot of them are brand new. I mean, brand new Christians. So it's so exciting to watch them grow and to watch to watch their excitement. Uh, but you need you need to have some good maps of the Holy Land. God chose Abraham and the Jews to do some things for him. He could have chosen the Cherokee Indians, and we'd have maps of Georgia and South Carolina in the back of our Bible. He could have chosen the Eskimos, and we'd have maps of Alaska and Canada, but he chose the Jews, so get familiar with that region. And uh, what happened? And I want to cover a little bit of history of uh, where did these people come from anyway? Who are these people and what problems they've caused? So that's why it's important to listen to Dad. So get that blank piece of paper. You need some maps to study to be a good Bible student. And I think, at least if you're a man, you need the timeline, visuals. Men like visuals, and they like things to be linear, in order, lined up, you know, A, B, C. A good man has his tools in order. He can go pick up his hammer, and he's got six hammers if he's a real man. Um, I counted my screwdrivers one time, had 120 screwdrivers. I thought, well, that may be just a little more than I need, but they'll be all kind of different use. Anyway, so you need uh, visuals and uh, uh, Bible maps, but we're going to talk about listen to Dad in the little things. When I was uh, 16, uh, I bought my first Volkswagen, 1963 Volkswagen. Uh, drove it for a while, loved it, and the kid that rode to school with me wanted to buy it, so I sold it to him, and I bought another 1962 Volkswagen. It wasn't quite in as good a shape. It uh, did have wall-to-wall -wall floorboards, barely, and had an AM-PM radio means it worked in the daytime and it worked at night uh, sometimes. And I uh, had some trouble with it and it tore the, uh, stripped the head bolts out on one side, um, blew the head get, blew the head off the, off the Volkswagen. It was about seven or maybe eight hamster power. Uh, and I think I tried to push it just a little too hard, maybe as a 17-year-old. At the time, I was dating quite a few uh, people, trying to find the right one. And we called it missionary dating, getting a lot of girls coming to church and coming to youth activities and double dating with my mom and dad. And, you know, and let them be picking the right one. So I turned 17 years old. And when I was 17, my uh, head bolts blew out of my Volks 62 Volkswagen. So I had it in the garage, tearing it down like we did almost every day, fixing something in Dad's garage, and he was out there working with us. Turned out I had to uh, tap out the uh, head bolts and uh, put in Healy coils. I won't explain all that, but you drill out the hole and you tap it out for a Healy coil, put a Healy coil in, put the head back on, and bolt it together. And my dad, wise man that he was, said, son, you need to change oil because you probably got metal shavings in the oil. And me being 17 and uh, ready for a hot date that night with a young lady I'd met at church the night before, Tim Smith and I had spoken at uh, a church in Peoria, Illinois. We shared our testimony and sang, believe it or not, I sang. <clears throat> that, that was a rare event. But the kids loved it, and this young girl came up, and she was crying. She said, oh, I've never heard people share testimonies of how they love the Lord. Nobody in my high school loves the Lord like that. And uh, 
now that is just great. And so I, I was in a hurry to go, and so Tim talked to her for a little bit. And that night I called uh, my buddy at her church and said his name was Randall from the, from the chess tournament. I'd beaten him in the chess tournament, and he went to that church. I said, uh, Randy, who, who was that girl? He said, oh, that was Joe Delia McGinnis. I said, you got her phone number? I said, well, yeah. So I got the phone number, and I called and asked her out for a date the next night uh, since we're having a youth activity at the... Um, within Morton, Illinois. Well, that's the same night that my head bolts blew out of my engine. So I limped the Volkswagen home on two cylinders, probably about a half a hamster power now, and I tore the motor apart the next day and was fixing it. Well, my dad said, change the oil sign. And being in a hurry to go out on this hot date with this young lady, I, I didn't listen to dad. I, that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Listen to dad, even in the little things. Matthew, chapter 1, verse number 1 and 2. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you please teach us something amazing from your word. Lord, use this book to shape us and chisel on us and sand on us and grind on us and make us better dads, better husbands, better brothers, better sons, better nephews, better neighbors. Lord, we've got a lot of hats we got to wear. I pray that you'll give us wisdom, Father. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit and give us your guidance to see to learn from other people's mistakes so we don't do the same dumb things. Lord, help us to see something amazing now from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. To the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. Look at those first two words. This is the book. I love that. It's not just any book. This is the book. And by the way, it's a book. God wrote it down. It's not just a legend that he passed on around the campfire. It's a book. You can read God's word. You don't have to take somebody's word for what it says. You read it yourself. It's not a legend. It's not a fairy tale. It's not mythology. Uh, it's the real, honest truth of what happened. Genesis 1 starts off that way. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He uses the word the, not a, not an, the definite article, the, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, who are these guys? Well, verse 2, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Okay, so get your piece of paper, turn it into portrait or landscape mode, and on the left-hand side, write the word Abraham, draw a little line over to... Before you get to the middle of the page, write the word Isaac. We're going to put a bunch of notes on here. I-S-A-A-C. And then draw the line straight over to the left or to the right and put the word Jacob. And then draw a line and put the word Judas or Judah. So we don't get confused. It's not the Judas that betrayed Jesus. This is Judah, J-U-D-A-H. They use the word Judas here, but this is not the Judas that betrayed Jesus later. Okay, so you got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah in a straight line across the middle of your paper with a dash in between each one of them. We're going to look at some of these guys. I'm going to show you each of them had some real serious flaws. They made some mistakes. So, I mean, like some, some of them, some really, really, really bad mistakes. And it cost them dearly. It cost the whole world dearly because they didn't listen to Dad in the little things. But then I want to show you how God, in his great mercy, in spite of their stupidity, used it for his glory. I don't think it's possible for us to mess things up so bad that God can't fix it. So for my adopted kids, <coughs> adopted uh, daughters and sons and uh, grandsons and granddaughters who say, oh, Dad, I've messed up. What do I do? I've ruined my life. Oh, no, 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 no. You haven't ruined your life. You made a mistake, it's probably going to cost you, it's going to hurt, and the Heavenly Father can forgive you, and he'll find you, and he'll fix it. Just give him all the pieces. I remember uh, October 5th, 1970, getting done bolting my Volkswagen back together, and uh, Dad saying, change oil, and me not paying attention, being, you know, I'm in a hurry. And I cranked it up, and it, boy, it felt great to have all 11 hamster power again. Man, it was awesome. So I took off to go pick up, well, I washed my hands, took a shower, got dressed, and took off to go my first day to pick up Joe Delia McGinnis over by the Peoria Airport on Fairview Road. I 
picked up Jodelia McGinnis and took her to all the way back to Morton, Illinois, to this youth activity. We had a great time singing activity, the Campus Life Club. And uh, I did not know uh, how to get home through Peoria very well, so I took her through Pekin across the bridge and headed up in... This call is from the San Jose County Sheriff's Office. Coming in the south way, Highway 24, I believe, or 29, one of those two. Uh, anyway. And all of a sudden, little lights started coming on on the dash of my Volkswagen. Now, this was a very unique Volkswagen. The dash lights knew Morse code. And being an Eagle Scout, I knew Morse code. And the little red lights on the Volkswagen dash started like flash, flashing at me. And they flashed out, you idiot. You should have listened to Dad. You should have changed oil. And after the dits and the dots were done, my engine just pooped out and we coasted over to the side of the road. So here we are, me on the first date with this beautiful young lady who later became my wife, sitting beside the road, 9 o'clock, she's got to be home at 9.30. You have 60 seconds remaining. My Volkswagen has just texted me saying, you're an idiot, you should have changed oil, this motor is fried. So I slid open the big sunroof on the 62 Volkswagen and said, stuck my hand out and said, let's pray. And that was our first prayer, our first date, long time ago. Let me call back and we'll continue the story. Okay. All right, so we sat there by the side of the road. I stuck out my hand and said, let's pray. I said, Lord, uh, this young lady has to be home in 30 minutes. My engine is shot. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't listen to Dad. Lord, I need your help. Would you please uh, help me to help this car to run a few more miles to get her home on time? That's my prayer, Lord. Jesus name amen and she looked at me like okay this is not normal we don't do this at our church we kind of all like pray for around meals and then it's the you know the standard prayer bless the bunch as they crunch the lunch kind of stuff and okay so I said well let's try it hit the key and boom started up drove it about four more miles to her driveway where it died again permanently and then that's when I thought you know I should have prayed for God to fix it you know, completely, not just four more miles, but, oh well, live and learn. I did get to scrap the Volkswagen for about a hundred bucks, though, so I got something out of it. Anyway, I then I, I learned, listen to Dad, I should have changed the oil. That night, uh, and of course, since my car was dead in her driveway, uh, I had to get a Dad next day, her mom took me home. Uh, Dad, uh, need a ride over to the airport to uh, pick up my Volkswagen. Okay, so Dad... Uh, drove over there and he got to meet her dad and it turned out they both worked at Caterpillar Tractor Company and had a good a good long talk. Her dad was a general foreman and my dad was an electrical engineer and they, they talked for a while and finally we tinkered with the Volkswagen and decided to tie a rope on it and drag it home. Back in those days you just drag cars all over the neighborhood so we, we dragged it home and I thought well not kind of embarrassing our first date I better take her out again so I took her out again and again and again dated three years and married her and has now been 42 years of being married. Anyway, I want to share with you some things, some mistakes other people made in their life and how God used it anyway, used it for his glory. Abraham, now, I'm not going to look up all the verses here about these guys. These, these guys are scattered all through Genesis, generally Genesis chapter 12, all the way to the end of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham and said, Abraham, i got a job for you. I want you to leave your family. And I want you to come to this special land I'm going to give you. And if you look at a Bible map, what today is the land of Israel, uh, used to be the land of Canaan. That's where the Canaanites lived. C-A-N-A-A-N. -A -A and so I want you to get familiar with the map here. That today is the land of Israel. Now the borders have changed a dozen times down through history. The land, of course, hasn't moved, but the borders have, kind of like the United States. So we've got a place here in Pensacola called Five Flags Speedway because Pensacola has been under five different flags. It was Spanish and French and Confederate and I don't know what all. And so... This call is from the San Jose County Sheriff's Office. Hence the name Five Flags. In Georgia, there's a Six Flags theme park because they've been under Six Flags. So the land of Canaan has had many different uh, names. But, so look on your map, and everything to the left of the Jordan River over to the Mediterranean Sea, that little skinny land right there, from the Sea of Galilee at the top down to the Sea of Dead Sea at the bottom, roughly, would be the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, and it's actually smaller than New Hampshire. It's about 7,000 square miles is roughly the nation of Israel today. 
So Abraham moves into that land and from uh, way over to the right, what today is the country of Kuwait, uh, where the city of Ur, you are, is. So God said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family. I want to show you a special land. Uh, so Abraham did not quite obey. If you look at Genesis chapter 12, God had said unto Abraham, Abraham, leave your family, and not his wife, of course, but the rest of your family, fathers, brothers, and move over to this land. And then you look down in verse number 4. So Abraham, Abram, his name was Abram at the time. Later God changed it to Abraham. Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Oh, mistake number one. Look back up at verse 1. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Well, Abram's father had a brother who had a son, Lot. And so this would be Abram's nephew. And Lot went with him. It's interesting. It doesn't say Abram invited him. It says Lot went. He decided to go. Now God had said, get away from your country. Get away from your kindred. And he didn't quite completely obey. Lot came with him. And verse 5, And Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son. And they came over to the land of Canaan. Verse number 5. This mistake ended up costing a lot. Lot, you can read later, moved to Sodom. They had too many sheep. The grass couldn't handle them, so they said, we got to split up. And Lot moved down to Sodom. So on your paper, right under the name Abraham, draw a line straight down and write the word Lot. And then from the word Lot, going over to the right, put a little line going up at an angle and down at an angle, like we're tra tracing a genealogy here, up at a 45 degree angle and down at a 45 degree angle. And I want you to write at the top the word Ammonite, A-M-M-O-N-I-T-E. And on the bottom one from Lot, these are his two sons, Ammon, and the bottom one is Moab, M-O-A-B, uh, where we get the Moabites. You can have the I-T-E-S on the end. So if you read the story in Genesis chapter 19, Lot moved down to Sodom, a whole city that was full of homosexuals. God destroyed the city, but before he did, he dragged Lot and his wife and two daughters out. Lot's wife turned back, turned into a pillar of salt, and this whole story's in Genesis there. And in Lot 19, the two daughters thought, oh wow, the whole nation is, the whole world is, everybody's dead, it's just us. And so they got their dad drunk and got him uh, and got impregnated by their own father. The children they produced at the end of Genesis 19 are the Ammonites and the Moabites. So go back to your map, and I want you to see where those folks settled. Two nations that should not even exist on the planet. If you look at your map uh, in the back of your Bible, if you find the Dead Sea, not the Red Sea, but the Dead Sea, the one shaped kind of like an egg down at the bottom of the nation of Israel, and go over to the right of the Dead Sea, at the top, from the top of the Dead Sea, go to the right and up just a little bit and write the word Ammon, A-M-M-O-N. That's where the Ammonites settled. And they were trouble for Israel. They still are today. It's been 4,000 years of trouble out of these people. Abraham didn't obey, and it's been costing his people for 4,000 years. From the bottom of the Dead Sea, go over to the right and write the word Moab, M-O-A-B. That's where the Moabites settled. And today that country is called Jordan, and the capital is Ammon, named after Ammon. And that's the whole, two whole nations that should not have existed had Abraham simply obeyed God. Now, just because they're Ammonites and Moabites doesn't mean God's not ever going to use them. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 4, that the Ammonite and the Moabite cannot come into the congregation for ten generations. And you can read the genealogy at the end of the book of uh, Ruth, and you'll see that uh, God used an illegitimate son uh, from uh, Judah, which we'll get to later, to have uh, the beginning of a genealogy that leads to King David. And Ruth was a Moabitess, if you read the book of Ruth. So yes, Ruth can't help what her parents and grandparents and great-grandparents great -grandparents did. Ruth said, God, I want to serve you. God said, come on in. You are welcome in the family, girl. And so Ruth was a Moabite. Okay, now back up to Abraham on your timeline here. 
Over to the right, you've got the next guy named Isaac, I-S-A-A-C. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. Back up to Abraham and draw another line going up and to the right a little bit at a 45 degree angle and write Genesis chapter 16 on that line. Abraham had a son he should not have had. He didn't completely listen to God. God said, you and Sarah are going to have a son. And she got too old to have children, so he married his servant girl, Hagar. And they had a son named Ishmael. Genesis chapter 16. The Bible says he's going to be a wild man. Now, Ishmael, you can write a few verses under his name. You can write Genesis uh, 37, verse 23. Are you still there, Rudy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, oh I thought maybe they thought maybe they clicked the phone off. Oh, okay, I'll pay, pay attention to the uh, 60 seconds. In Genesis 37, verse 33, it tells us that Ishmael is the Midianites. The descendants of Ishmael became the Midianites. So go back to your map. And I want you to look at the, the bottom of the map, at the Red Sea, where the Red Sea has two fingers coming up, kind of like making the victory sign. They call the area between that the Sinai Peninsula, but that is not correct. Mount Sinai is not even there. What happened a few hundred years after Christ? Some princess is riding her chariot down there, and she saw a mountain and said, oh, that looks like Mount Sinai. And they said, oh, yes, your highness, yes, your highness, and they put a sign on it, Mount Sinai, and everybody has called it Mount Sinai ever since, and that is not Mount Sinai. The poor lady didn't have a clue. All you got to do is read the Bible, and it tells us where Sinai is. But from those two fingers on the Red Sea, the run on the far, on the far right is called the Gulf of Aqaba, A-Q-A-B-A. -A. On the right of that Gulf of Aqaba is what today is Saudi Arabia. I want you to write the word Midian in there. M-I-D-I-A-N. That's where the Midianites settled. These would be the descendants of Ishmael, the son that Abraham should not have had, but he did. And he's going to be a wild man. He's going to attack everybody, and everybody's going to attack him. So if you go to the book, you can just write a note in there. The book of Galatians, chapter 4, tells us that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Galatians chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. This call is from the Sinai Delta County Sheriff's Office. Sinai's in Arabia. It's not over there in the, what they call the Sinai Peninsula. And the children of Israel did not cross the Gulf of Suez to get into Mount Sinai. They crossed the Gulf of Aqaba to get over. And Mount Sinai is right there in Arabia where the Midianites settled. Well, just because Abram didn't listen to God... And he had this son, he didn't trust God, he had a son he shouldn't have had, became the father of all the Ishmaelites, the Midian, Midianites, and most of those are the Arabs today, and that's where Mecca is, and the uh, uh, Saudi, Saudi kingdom, and the, uh, some pretty wild people that, that, that attack seem to want to attack everybody, and there certainly are the Arabs in that area. That is where uh, Ishmael settled. But God wasn't done. He said, I can still use you if you want to serve me. If you go to Exodus chapter 2 and verse 15, you'll see that Moses, when he fled from Pharaoh, uh, about 40 years of age, he took off and running, and he, he flew, went clear over to the land of Midian and lived there. And in the land of Midian, he got a job working for a guy, and he gave him his daughter to be his wife. So Moses married a woman who was a Midianite which means Moses' children are half Midianite, half Jew. These folks are all related. So God's not done with the Midianites just because great-great-grandpa made a mistake. Forget it. God can still use you. Anyway, back to our line now that goes from Abraham to Isaac. Under that line, I want you to write Genesis 21. This tells the story of Isaac being born. And Isaac was a pretty good guy. He made a couple mistakes. He claimed his wife was actually his sister and nearly had a mess over that. And you can read all that story. Uh, from Isaac, though, I want you to draw two lines going to the right. Isaac had two sons. The one going straight over goes to Jacob, which we'll talk about in a minute. But then draw another one going up at an angle and put the word Esau, E-S-A-U. Now the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 36 that Esau is Edom. Hmm. Genesis chapter 36, verse number 1. It explains who this is, and Esau is the other son of Isaac. He didn't seem to be interested in spiritual things at all. Esau is the 
the one that sold his uh, his inheritance for a bowl of soup. What a moron. Uh, he just didn't understand the value of eternal things. And there's a lot of people today, they will trade away their future for some drugs to get high for a couple hours. Or trade away their future, trade away their marriage, trade away their family for, for a few minutes of fun with a prostitute or another woman. Like morons. What is wrong with you? Don't you, can't you think past five minutes? Some people can't, apparently, I don't know, but they trade the way for you know, drugs, alcohol, or sex. I don't understand that thinking, but there are folks that do that. They're, they're very, very short. You have 60 seconds remaining. Don't do that. Anyway, Genesis 36, 1. Now, these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Okay? So go back to your map, and I want you to look to the Dead Sea again. Not the Red Sea, but the Dead Sea. And I want you to go over to the right, where you got Moab, drop down below that, halfway between Moab and Midian, write the word Edom, E-D-O-M. That's where the Edomites settled. So here, Abraham and his children in the land of Canaan are going to be surrounded by people who are cousins and who hate them. And for the rest of the Bible, you see these folks causing trouble, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Midianites. Let me call right back and continue. All right. To accept this call, press 5. This call is subject to monitoring and recording. Do not use three-way or call waiting features during this call. Thank you for using Global Tell Link. All right, let's continue our Bible study of who are these guys. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We see where Esau is actually Edom, the Edomites, and they feature all through the Bible, including King Herod, who was an Edomite who was the one who killed all the babies, uh, tried to kill baby Jesus. He somehow became the king of Israel. And you can do a study on that whole thing if you'd like. But, so back to the main center line on your paper. We got Abraham going straight over to the right. We got Isaac. Go to the right. We got Jacob. Now, under the word Jacob in parentheses, write the word Israel. Because God changed his name. Jacob was a trickster. The name Jacob means trickster or something like that, and Israel means prince with God. So you see, the same guy's got two names and two totally different personalities. Some days he acted like Israel, a prince with God. Other days he acted like Jacob, the trickster. And if you're a Christian, you probably have two totally different personalities also. There are days when you can act like a child of God should act, and there are days when you act like a fool, like the old sinner, heathen that you were. That's just kind of normal standard uh, Romans chapter 7 and 8 talk about that. The two natures, the two personalities that Christians have. We've got the spirit living in us and the, want, the part of us wants to do right and we've got the old flesh in us that wants to do wrong. So welcome to the war. It doesn't get any better. After 46 years, I can tell you, it is still a battle. Anyway, from Jacob, you're going to draw a line over to the right and write the word Judah. However, Judah is only one of 13 kids. So from Jacob, you could draw 13 lines if you'd like, but or just draw one line up and to the right, and write that he's got a bunch of brothers and sisters. For instance, Reuben. Now, Reuben was the oldest, the firstborn of Jacob, and Reuben actually committed adultery with his own stepmother. Jacob had four wives. You can read that story in Genesis 35 and verse 22. But what a moron. Could you imagine those... 13 kids growing up in that one family. Each of them had to live with three stepmothers. The constant fighting and bickering between the four women in one house. I am very glad I don't have that problem. So, anyway, from Judah, I want you to draw, uh, draw a little parentheses underneath his name and just put Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38 tells the story of Judah getting married to a Canaanite and had three sons and there's a very interesting story there. Anyway, the long uh, story can be shortened up to say Judah ended up being enticed by his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and he had a child by her named two of them, two of them actually twins, Pharez, an illegitimate child with his own daughter-in-law. This is Judah. Boy, he had some problems. That's not good, Judah, what you blew it, son. So, these, this illegitimate
legitimate son Pharez is a bastard son, and according to Deuteronomy 23, a bastard cannot come into the congregation for ten generations. He messed up the family gene pool for ten generations. God worked around it and come. This call is from the Son of Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. <clears throat> you come out in the tenth generation with King David. God was getting a king ready for him. You can see that genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, the next couple of verses. You look for a guy named Pharez. Or you go back to Ruth chapter 4 at the end of the chapter and see that genealogy again. Or uh, Luke chapter 3 and see it written backwards from Pharez. Uh, anyway, so that we see all of these guys. Abraham made some awful mistakes and it cost it's still costing them. Isaac made some mistakes and it cost them. And one of Isaac's sons, Esau, was not the least bit interested in spiritual things. He became the Edomites, and you can read the history of Israel. They caused trouble all along. I mean, it was constant trouble for the people of Israel. Jacob tricked everybody around him, and he ended up getting tricked and married the wrong woman. What an interesting story. When you read about Jacob, and God changed his name to Israel, and uh, he wrestled with an angel and lived the rest of his life. And by the way, after you wrestle with God, it'll change your walk, too. Spend some time wrestling with God. Judah. Man, did Judah blow it. The only one of those 12 sons that he had, about which not a single thing bad is ever said in the whole Bible, is the one guy named Joseph. He's one of those 12 sons, and he's the one the brothers sold him to be a slave down in Egypt. God turned him into the vice pharaoh and married a princess and all. That's a great story in the book of Genesis. So out of those 12, Joseph is the only, <clears throat> I guess what we would call normal one, who tried to, tried to serve God no matter what happened to him. He got thrown in prison for 13 years for nothing, for doing what's right, actually. He refused to have sex with his boss's wife, and so they threw him in prison. 13 years, and God used it in a powerful way. Anyway, what lessons can we learn from these four guys, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah? Well, we can learn they're all messed up. They have made royal messes of their life made some tragic mistakes. It cost them. Sometimes it is still costing them. And by the way, you can get drunk, go drive your car, get in a wreck, and cut your arm off, and say, God, I'm sorry, and he will forgive you, and he will welcome you back, but your arm will not grow back. You will be affected the rest of your life. So just, it'll be a constant reminder, like my Volkswagen, little lights flashing, you idiot. You shouldn't have done that. You should have listened to Dad. So uh, we've probably all got scars on our body. I've got a scar on my knee where I was chainsawing the tree that uh, fell on my son's house when the hurricane hit, trying to get it off to get the water to stop coming in the ruin in the rest of the house. And I stepped over the log a little too fast while the chainsaws not quite stopped and got 15 stitches in my knee. Well, that's a constant reminder. You know, slow down just a little bit when you're handling a chainsaw. I happen to be the first uh, injury in at the hospital, and they ended up, they told me later, they said, yeah, we had 70 chainsaw accidents that, uh, that because of that hurricane, 65 of them to the left knee, and I have the honor, the privilege, the distinction of being the very first. Yay, Kent. Okay, what are some lessons we can learn? Go to Genesis chapter 50, and verse number 20. Joseph's brothers, the only one that never did anything wrong, was sold to be a slave down in Egypt. When he got to be vice pharaoh and his brothers came down, had to buy food off of him, they ended up living there. It was probably a mistake. They stayed there for 400 years. <laughs> and made slave, people made slaves out of them. Moses had to lead them out. But in Genesis chapter 50, his brothers were worried. Now that dad has died, and said, oh, no, now the brother Joseph, the pharaoh of Egypt, the vice pharaoh, he's going to get mad. He's going to take vengeance on us for what we did to him, you know, 100 years ago. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20, Joseph said, verse 19, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? In other words, I don't make these judgments. God handles this. Verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. You know, brother, there are some people who thought evil against me that we're going to put that guy in prison. And they did. It's been uh, and coming up next week. It'll be eight and one half years in prison, and I still maintain I did nothing wrong to come to prison. I did not break any laws, and I should not be here. But I can assure you, it's God's problem to take care of those who did this, not mine. And 
They meant it for evil, no question, but God has used it for good. This has been good in a thousand ways. It has been hard, and I hope it's over, and I want to go home. But God has used it for good, and certainly he's changed the lives of many, many people. Even the men right here in this spot, I get so excited watching some of these young converts grow, get excited about the Bible and learning Bible verses. And uh, If they memorize verses, they earn points and they can buy commissary. Some of them have nobody helping them out there, so that's a great blessing to be able to buy soups or a donut or something. So, uh, it's, just, it's It's been wonderful. Uh, if God sends you to prison, it is very hard and it is very wonderful at the same time. God can use it in a great way. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. But a, a book of Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. Romans eight twenty-eight. the Bible says, We know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Now that verse does not say all things are good. It says they work together for good. This prison time is going to work together for good if I meet the qualifications, which is pretty simple. It's right there in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. All I have to do is make sure my heart stays right with God. That's all you have to do. Go to my adopted family out there, and my real family, and anybody else who's not either one of those. If you keep your heart right with God, and you try to serve Him, everything will work out for good. Relax. It's going to be fine. I use the illustration in my seminar that the individual ingredients for many recipes taste terrible. If you came to my house and said, Kent, I'm starving. Give me something to eat. I said, well, here's a cup of flour. You know, uh, that would taste terrible. Well, how about a spoonful of baking soda? Uh, how about a cup of buttermilk? How about we mix them all together and make biscuits? Well, now we're talking. See, the individual ingredients for biscuits taste lousy, but they work together for biscuits. And the individual things that happen in your life may be lousy, but they can work together for good. This call is from the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office. Maybe God's making biscuits. Relax. Let him cook. He knows what he's doing. Pinch of this, pinch of that. Maybe you got a neighbor just drives you nuts. Okay, maybe God's trying to get something out of you from that. Maybe he's trying to develop some patience or some kindness or who knows what. I don't know. You just keep your heart right with God. Maybe it's financial problems. Maybe the boss is a jerk. Maybe you're a jerk. Maybe you need to fix that. Uh, but, you know, just keep your heart right with God. And if you do, everything will work together for your good. I promise that. Romans chapter 8. So, have you messed things up? Welcome to the family. Everybody in God's family has messed up royally. There's only a couple I can find that didn't have anything bad to say about them. Joseph, later Daniel, of course Jesus Christ. Nothing bad to say. Everybody else seems to have messed up pretty good. John chapter 14 and verse 1 to 6. Let's read there real quick. John chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I always do that when I'm giving a Bible study for the guys because I don't want to embarrass them if they can't find it. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. So, listen, kids, if you have the Father, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, and you have been saved, and you become a child of the Father, you're going to heaven, it's going to be fine. If you haven't, if you're not part of the family, why not? What on earth are you waiting for? You have an invitation to come. Go to the very, very end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, right where the whole thing closes out. Revelation, chapter 22, the last chapter in the book. And I want to show you something starting in verse number 18. Revelation 17, I guess we'll start with 17. Revelation 22, yeah, start with verse 16. 
I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. Three times, come, come, come. What are you waiting for? Have you come to the Father yet? If you're not a Christian, if you're not saved, I would encourage you to come. The door's open. Kind of like Noah's Ark. Hey, get on board before the flood comes. Get in. Anybody can come. Anybody can come to heaven. The doors are wide open. Come. Forty-six years ago, my friend said, Kent, are you going to heaven? I said, I don't know. He said, would you like to go? I said, yeah. But I don't know what to do. And he explained that I'm a sinner and I've broken God's laws and I'm guilty and Jesus died for me and wrote... You have 60 seconds remaining. Pray and ask him to save you. So I prayed. I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. But I believe you died for me. Would you please come into my heart and save me right now? February 9, 1969. I came into the family. You can too. If you do, let me know so I can rejoice with you. I'll be glad to help you grow in the Lord. All right, that's our Bible study for today. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Pastor Owen.